Good evening. On behalf of ProPublica and KPCC in person, welcome to the Los Angeles Theater Center, operated by the Latino Theater Company. We ask that you take a moment to locate the nearest emergency exit. Also, please silence your devices at this time. Photos are okay, but please, no flash and no audio or video recording. Tonight's program is made possible by the James Irvine Foundation. We're grateful to them for their support and to you for being here this evening. We hope you'll join us at the reception in the lobby after the event. Thank you. Brown. What color is my skin? It is brown. Coffee, almond, chocolate, caramel. Dirt, earth, ground. It is the color of tinted melanin. The color of muddy monsoon puddles overflowing and centuries of rice paddy fields dry. It is the color of decades of migration and surviving and of, I like the color of your tan, when my teamster working mother would come home from a long day of work in the Los Angeles summer sun, she'd extend her forearms to me and say, look at how dark I got, how brown I got. I'd look, her chubby fingers calloused, her arms worked and tired, and her brown skin was lived and beautiful. She survived till she couldn't. She gave me this brown skin. My skin is the brown color of insulted looks from other browns for when I say, sorry, I don't speak your language, because this kind of brown makes everyone think I should be speaking in their own brown mother tongue. It is that brown kinship. My skin is also the brown color of speak English, when in my reality, my bangla pigeon tongue was formerly trained in nothing else. This brown skin is the color of Manzanar, Tijuana, Angel Island. It is the color of Mughal Empire, East India Trading Company, West Bengal, and Bangladesh. My skin is the color of Guantanamo Bay, Standing Rock, Flint, and Ferguson, of borders, airports, and detention centers. It is the color of go back to your own country, and getting shot in your driveway for wearing a turban. It is the color of being murdered in a bar and then later being told, you're Indian, my bad, I thought you were Iranian. It is being asked on a plane if you are carrying bombs in your bag and that all illegals need to get out. It is an execution style murder over a parking dispute. It is having bombs thrown at your place of worship to scare Muslims out of the country. It is a stabbing of hijabied women on a train, all in the name of patriotism. My skin is brown, and I am a Muslim woman, an Asian woman, a woman of color, and I don't need your solidarity. I need you to believe in my intersectional humanity, that survival is transnational, borderless, and migratory, that our liberations are intertwined. My skin is brown like the poetry scratched into the wooden walls of an immigration station, prayers carved into dirt floors at an internment camp, prose on protest signs on these LA streets. My skin, it is brown. My humanity deserves no loyalty test, and my living deserves no brown paper bag test. They have painted my skin with the color of fear, but that only goes skin deep. This brown skin is beautiful. This tan is the shade of persistence. And this melanin, the color of resistance.
That was Taz Ahmed with her poem, Brown, one of a handful of reflections that we hear throughout the evening. Hello, everybody. My name is Adolfo Guzman Lopez. I'm education correspondent at KPCC. And I'm A.C. Thompson. I'm a reporter with ProPublica. Tonight's the third installment of a three-part event series by KPCC in which we're exploring hate and hate crimes. So it's inspired by a project at ProPublica that we started about 18 months ago when we realized that there was a new era of ugliness afoot in America. And we, we thought, you know, this is something that we can't cover on our own. We see a rise in active hate groups. We see what seems to be a rise in hate crimes. And we can't do this as one newsroom, uh, even though we've got a lot of great investigative reporters. So we built a coalition of about 140 different news organizations KPCC is one of them. And we've basically been asking the public to tell us their stories. What has happened to you? Have you been the victim of a hate crime? Have you been uh, the victim of an incident of bigotry that is awful but maybe doesn't rise to the level of crime? We collect those stories, we verify them, and we share them with the public. We've broken up the evening tonight into three parts, then, now, and tomorrow. So let's get started. Um, one of the themes tonight, AC, is this idea that there are layers of history that are yet to be uncovered, especially when it comes to hate, um, which has more often than not, you know, not been, you know, in the Chamber of Commerce pamphlets, and it's not been in the official histories as they're written. So we need to keep digging, as you and as many other reporters have been doing, we need to keep digging for those histories. So for this part, AC and I are going to be talking about the historical trends of hate crimes in Southern California and how that history has shaped who we are as Southern Californians, what Southern California is today, and uh, that's what you're going to be hearing throughout the evening. Um, AC, you know, among one of your expertises is going to far-flung places, spending time, getting a, a real sense of the lay of the land, doing a lot of digging and reporting, and you know, sometimes putting together the research and the data next to what you're seeing on the ground. And you've been doing that in Southern California. You've been in LA, Orange County, the Inland Empire. Yeah, so I recently did a, a reporting trip down here. I'm from Northern California, please don't hold it against me. And I went all over Southern California working on a, a documentary we're making with ProPublica and the PBS show Frontline. And it was kind of crazy because everywhere I went, I wanted to talk to people about now, and they kept bringing up the past. And they kept saying, you know, to understand what's happening today, you have to look back. Um, in Orange County, I met with Gustavo Ariano, who we had actually hoped to have on this panel, but he's traveling. And he said, dude, you don't get it. This county was founded in part by a very active Klansman who was a member of the original KKK, formed right after the Civil War. His name uh, <coughs> was uh, Henry William Head. He was a prominent uh, medical doctor in Orange County, and he's one of the guys that, that said, hey, Orange County should break away from Los Angeles. And like you said, he's a guy who's like not written up as being a Klansman in the, the Chamber of Commerce well, brochures. One of the interesting things about Gustavo is that he's almost created this um, you know, kind of know your racist history beat right, right. <laughs> in Orange County in the various publications he, he writes for. What else did he tell you about some of that history in Orange County and some of the, the racism that's, that's hidden in the layers of the history there? Yeah, that is exactly a beat that he's created. And so, you know, you start there, you start there at the beginning uh, with the first wave of the Klan and with one of the founding fathers of Orange County. And then we move ahead to the 1920s, the second wave of the Klan. And Anaheim had one of the strongest, biggest Klan uh, movements, biggest Klan uh, claverns in the country. Like, so we think about the South, we think about the KKK being the Southern thing. No. It was a Southern California thing. And there are still, uh, you know, at least a dozen buildings, parks, streets, and a school named after former Klansmen 
in Orange County. So what's interesting about that is, is that here, you know, in 2018, we still have a very strong sense that Orange County, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago was a Republican bastion, that a lot of conservative ideas that ended up spreading throughout the nation started in Orange County. So it's almost as if, you know, we're, we, we don't know about the 50, a hundred years ago, which is what you started to talk and discover, talk to Gustavo about and discover, right? Yeah, you know, exactly. I had been in Charlottesville where people were rallying about Confederate monuments and being Nazis and being awful. And it's like I come to Southern California and I realize, oh, there's some of this history here as well that people have forgotten. There are uh, high schools that have rebel mascots. There are, uh, you know, um, there's a cemetery named after a Klansman. There's multiple streets named after Klansmen. You know, it kind of blew my mind. You also talked to uh, police, law enforcement. What, what did they tell you? Yeah, you know, so one of the people that we talked to was a former Orange County probation officer. And he said, you know, when I retired a, a few years back from probation, I had more than 100 white supremacists on my caseload. That's all I did was white supremacists. And I, I was just blown away. I said, really? And he said, yeah, you, you should understand that um, particularly 80s, 90s, but even into more recently, this has been a hotbed for racial extremists. So we had um, groups like White Aryan Resistance that was based out of San Diego, but had a lot of followers in Orange County. You had the Hammerskins that was a neo-Nazi skinhead organization that had a big presence in Orange County. And then you had the white prison gang. So there's been a big population of these kinds of extremists circulating Orange County, Inland Empire, San Diego, and sometimes in the southern Los Angeles beach cities. So as you're talking to all these people, as you're uncovering these, these histories, you know, uh, how does the reporting process work? Share with us what you're going to do with that information and how you know, people here and, uh, are going to be able to see that. Yeah, so we, we have a documentary that's going to air on PBS uh, in August, this August, hopefully, uh, if we get our act together. And, you know, basically, it's going to take you on this tour of that sort of terrain. But also, you know, what our, what our goal with the work that we're doing is, is to hold these organized hate groups accountable. I think a lot of the reporting that we've seen is sort of people putting a microphone in the face of some white supremacist and saying, hey spew a bunch of bile here and we're going to put it on TV. And for us, like what we're doing is we're looking at law enforcement and about whether they're really going after these people. We're looking at the people who are aiding, abetting them. We're looking at the people who don't want the spotlight and shining it on them. One of the interesting things about what the reporting that you've done is, uh, you know, I think you, we, we can categorize it as accountability reporting, right? You, you uh, wrote quite a bit about in the, correct me if I'm wrong, in the aftermath of Katrina in New Orleans, how police officers were killing people, it, no due process whatsoever. You've also written uh, about United States government rendition uh, projects and campaigns. I'm wondering how this reporting project compares to some of the other work that you've done, similarities and differences and kind of way, way, yeah. I mean, honestly, like being in this country now is sometimes scarier than being in Afghanistan during 2005, 2006, so? in the height of the war in some ways. Um, being here now, I think, is, is scarier and different. Um, but the, the theme is the same. The theme is like, look, there are people, exactly, there's people that you can hold accountable. Uh, these, these things don't happen in a vacuum. There are people who should be responding effectively. There are government systems that should be in place to curb this uh, ugliness that's afoot. And our question is, is that actually happening? You know, are, are the people that we uh, count on to actually respond effectively to, say, white domestic terror organizations, are they doing that? Or are they constantly uh, focusing on supposed Islamic terror groups or supposed black identity extremists. And that's the sort of accountability piece. And what, what are the discussions that you've had with your editors about the value of this kind of reporting? Why, why put it out there? You know, that's, that's a good question. I mean, for us, I think what we, when we started this project, Documenting Hate, I think part of what we were thinking is like uh, the world 
is we're seeing this resurgence. We're seeing this revival of hate. Clearly, it never went away, but we're seeing a new wave of it. And I think we felt if we can change things on the ground, if we can have some sort of true impact, that's ideal. But if the least that we can do is to bear witness to this moment, then we need to bear witness to it, and we need to allow people to tell their stories and to share what they've been through. You know, you're, you're making me think of, of a story I reported a number of years back about uh, 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 people from Rwanda who came to USC's Shoah Center, Shoah Center and, you know, learned the ways that um, the, the documentation was happening there of the Holocaust survivors, right? And so these, uh, these people from Rwanda were learning how to document all of this hate and killing that had happened in Rwanda, right? Um, and and it, it is so important to, you know, document these testimonies, right? Yeah, you know, you said something interesting when we were talking on the phone, and you said you thought in some ways there was, there was racism in the DNA of Southern California. Tell me, tell me what you meant about that. Well, you know, in, in 17 years of reporting at, at KPCC and here in Los Angeles, I've learned so much about the history of this place. Um, one of the interesting things is that, one of the things that interests me is how Los Angeles transitioned from a Mexican town to an American town. And the transition wasn't always clean, right? So uh, one of the most interesting characters in that regard is, is a man by the name of Francisco Ramirez, who worked not too far from here. So in the 1850s, he was the editor of a Spanish language newspaper in Los Angeles called El Clamor Público. So in the 1950s, he was um, writing about lynchings in Los Angeles, lynchings of Mexicans. Um, to the point they were happening so often that he called, he coined the term linchocracia, a lynchocracy, rule by those who carry out lynchings. So how much do people know about this, this history now, do you think? I mean, because I had never heard about this stuff when you were telling me. You know, unfortunately, that, at least that chapter is relegated to PhD dissertations. That's kind of how I found out about it. Um, the other, you know, so so we have to look at what happens after the 1850s, right? So in in the 1860s, um, newspaper articles start being published, not by El Clamor Público, but by other newspapers in Los Angeles, lashing out at Chinese and Chinese American residents of Los Angeles, and virulent anti-immigrant articles. So what happens? You've got this violence. Now, this is an incident that is more or less known, the Chinese massacre of 1871, where 18 uh, Chinese boys and men are killed by a mob. Uh, not too far from here, actually, in uh, kind of the near the Overa Street part of Los Angeles. So, so it's all here. It's under, it's under our feet. And, and when, you, when you come up to World War II era, what was the sort of role that you would say when it came to the, the internment of Japanese American population? What, what, what was going on in Southern California with that? Well, some of the same dynamic, right? So, some of the same dynamic of, you know, an, newspaper articles being written attacking a certain ethnic group lay, gra lay the groundwork, right? Uh, you talked about internment. In 1943, there's also the well-known incident, and well-known because um, a lot of Chicanos in Los Angeles, Mexican-Americans, keep, keep it alive. Keep it alive because it, they had relatives who took part in the Zoot Suit riots. Um, so in 1943, after numerous articles criticizing Mexican-Americans in Los Angeles, you had this incident where uh, sailors on leave... Uh, Los Angeles in this area was very much a military town. Sailors on leave engage in this violence against anybody they see with a zoot suit, which is generally Mexican Americans. And in some of the stories that I've done over the years, some of the counter uh, narratives are ones of 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 family of, of people I've talked to who had family members who were in the military, Chicanos in the military who go out to defend these zoot suiters, take off their uniform, and go defend you know, these Mexican-Americans being attacked. Out, out of all your research, what, what sticks out to you the most on this kind of secret history? Um, that 
that remembering still takes a lot of effort and that the education and that the, the, the histories have to be told time and time again. I think we're very different from New York in this respect. I think there might be a, a critical mass of historians, historical organizations that really, you know, establish what happened in the Lower East Side, what happened uh, in Five Points, what happened in these various neighborhoods. And uh, that's part of, you know, the known history of Manhattan. I think we've got a ways to go here. You think maybe on the West Coast we, we're not quite as good at keeping our own histories, perhaps? No, I think we need more people, you know, doing those testimonies, and and you know that's that's part of what this uh, this evening's all about. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about, and we will talk about all these things right after this. <laughs> somewhere between Orlando and a biopsy. My left breast goes into a hole, center of a long table. I think that is odd. Why is the hole in the center? I lay down on my stomach to position myself at the table's midsection. The vice comes in and the nurse's hand tugs and pulls, and we converse anyway. There is a doctor coming soon named Needle. Hello, Needle. Hurry up, I will say. The nurse will pat my back at its center and ask me what I do for a living. This is always the tricky part between strangers. Keep it light or keep it real. Tell her everything. Cut to the chase. What do I have to lose? We will be here for 40 minutes. She will have my left breast in her right hand for most of it. Enough time for honesty and judgment without the sting of attachment. If what I say centers around her discomfort, then she will still have my left breast in a vice and we will be even. I tell her everything. I cut to the chase. I have nothing to lose. I speak in lean terms. I center on my truths. Me is queer. Me with mind split between yesterday's shooting and tonight's vigil. Me in vigilance for the dead, as much as for those left running for cover in the days, weeks, and years in a cycle of backlash. Me in love and solidarity with my queer folk, Muslim community, our immigrant families, and the list continues. My politics are not shy. My words attempt to carve an avenue on this cold biopsy table. She looks me in the eye. She listens and nods. A map emerges between us. She says she wishes she could join me. There is work and life and no time, and she tells me, you go to this vigil for me too. I wish I could nod back, but I can't move from the center. Instead, I moan. She understands that language much better than I do. She speaks in possibility and kindness and grabs my hand. Within minutes, I chart her origins. We locate an old dream of her, once a painter. Within minutes, she navigates my politics and my relations. She nods as I moan and squeeze her fingers. My half-numb breast is stuck in a vise with a needle at its center, and all is good, and I am fine.
Kato Kiriyama, and that was her piece, Somewhere Between Orlando and a Biopsy. I want to introduce uh, Brian Levin. Brian Levin is a guy who is basically a source, a source of information for any reporter covering the hate beat. He is one of the foremost experts on the statistics of hate crimes. He's been tracking this for many, many years. And I would say he probably has a better grasp on the subject than the FBI. So this is Brian Levin. He is the director of the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at Cal State San Bernardino. So I told you about some stuff I wanted to talk about, and you said, no, 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 let's talk about something else. Um, and you had good ideas for questions, so let me put one of those to you. Your own question, to you. You wanted to talk about the connection between political speech and what you're seeing in, in hate crimes, um, the political climate. Can you tell me about that? Sure. By the way, I, I, I loved his other <laughs> issues as well. We'll, uh, we'll get to those as well. Um, we're nonpartisan. Uh, obviously, we're opposed to prejudice. Uh, but one of the things that I think is really necessary is the best data that we can get and transparency with regard to its limitations. I got a lot of calls at various times saying, what's going on? So we went and looked at the data that we had. Let me give you uh, a specific answer to a specific question. Um, on December 2nd, 2015, uh, a horrendous terrorist attack hit our, our community of San Bernardino. And we had an increase in apparent hate crime uh, nationally over the next five days. We, interestingly enough, we didn't have anything in San Bernardino City proper. Uh, we had a, a big interfaith presence. But nevertheless, uh, what I tried to do was go through whatever available sources there were, uh, news media, civil rights groups, official reports, and carve out those cases that were actually criminal and appeared to be motivated uh, by anti-Muslim prejudice, for instance. And we found a significant increase in the five days after the rollout of the Muslim ban proposal, which took place in three parts on December 7th, 2015, five days after San, the San Bernardino attack. Um, we were pilloried by by uh, some folks on, on uh, the extremes of politics. Uh, but you know what? Uh, I've been collecting this data for 30 years. Uh, our center has a former FBI unit chief in charge, so that just kind of rolls off my shoulders. The true test was when the FBI came, data came out, would it confirm it? And yes, it did. And so what, what you're seeing is you have, say, a terror attack, say you have uh, the president proposing uh, the Muslim ban, and then you see what seems to be a spike of hate activity around those incidents. Is that, am I getting it right? Absolutely, and not only that, if anything, the, uh, the heightened level of attacks continued uh, going forward for even longer than our initial uh, report indicated. And, and the, the crimes themselves, at least from our initial study, uh, they were not only more of them, but they were worse. Fire bombings, threats on a congressman, things like that. Conversely, we looked at 9-11, where we had a tremendous spike in hate crime after 9-11. Six days, whoops, six. <laughs> six days after 9-11, President Bush, uh, also a Republican, spoke at the Islamic Center of D.C. There were 15 hate crimes that day. He spoke late in the afternoon. The next day there were five hate crimes against Muslims dropped by two-thirds the following year. Um, in this other case, what we found was from 2014 to 2016, the FBI, FBI data indicated a 99% increase in anti-Muslim uh, hate crime. Uh, so at least for that limited window, uh, with the five days after San Bernardino, there was a spike, and then there was an additional spike above and beyond the spike that correlated to the terrorist attack. 
And I, th I think what you're driving at here is that in a previous administration, you have an incident, an awful incident, and you have the, the president working to tamp it down. And I think what you're driving at is currently, you have leaders who are not trying to say, hey, um, this does not reflect on the entire Islamic community, this does not reflect on the entire Muslim community. Uh, we need to get together as one nation and uh, build some unity here. What you're seeing is, I think you're suggesting is the opposite. <laughs> I gotta be very careful because I'm- Be careful, I, I, I'm just, I'm giving you my I, interpretation. I, I, so. I'm, I'm the data guy. Right. So the, the data is not always as predictive and diagnostic as we like, but we, when we start getting to doing day by day ticks of the numbers of hate crimes, and they're significantly elevated after the rollout of a Muslim ban proposal and a, uh, and, and a really um, intense speech that evening. There was a Twitter announcement, a web announcement, and an announcement on national television for over an hour that night. Uh, we saw uh, a couple, we saw a firebombing over that night. Um, and, and, and we saw this level to be significantly higher than the average daily number uh, the rest of the previous year. Uh, so, so that was something. And we also saw 2016, and there's a, a wonderful group called ProPublica, uh, you might be aware of, and, and, and there's a fellow from there who was the first in the country to say, you know what, when the FBI data came out that morning, he went through and found that there was a 25.9% increase for the fourth quarter 2016 over the fourth quarter 2015. So suggestive that the rhetoric around the election may have played a role in that increase. Suggestive. Oh, ab not. absolutely. I don't think we can dismiss it. And one of the reasons we're not making a forecast for 2018, even though we have some limited data, is because we have a very conflictual election coming up. So we're, we're not trying to, to criticize folks as much as say, this is what the data shows. I, obviously, you know, I, I, did a, I did a talk somewhere and someone said, I really enjoyed your talk, but it lacked the moral indignation that you should have had from someone who goes through this. But I said, I'll leave that to others who are, who are more eloquent than me. So you've been looking at these statistics since they started collecting these statistics? Before. Before, okay, even in, in longer. In fact, 88, in, in New York City, uh, in 88, worst month of the year, November. Wow, wow. So I think there's something that I'd like you to share with this audience, which is, uh, I want you to explain sort of the flaws in the FBI data and the flaws in how the FBI collects the data. There's myriad flaws. And, and this is the, the federal hate crime data that we use as a baseline to understand this problem, okay. Sure. In April 1990, President uh, Bush 41 signed the Hate Crime Statistics Act. Uh, in 91, we had a limited rollout. 92 was the first real year that we started collecting uh, hate crime information. Uh, but what we found is, for instance, half the hate crimes in the United States reported uh, by the FBI in 2016 just came from a half a dozen states. California, New York, uh, and some of the other larger states, for instance. Is that because all the other states are great and they don't have any problems? Absolutely. Uh, no, Mississippi like reports zero, sometimes report two or four. Um, uh, the Associated Press did a, did a uh, study back in 2016 and they found that there were about 16 states where 25% or more of the law enforcement agencies uh, hadn't reported a hate crime in the previous six years. In California, we have about a half a dozen counties uh, mostly up north and, and rural. Uh, so we asked the legislature last year, and bipartisan they approved, to do an audit to see like, you know, why this isn't uh, happening. So, for instance, many of the states that have the largest percentage, largest proportions of African American states like Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, for instance, uh, report minimal numbers of hate crimes. So we're skewing the data. And, and you think that's just not accurate. You think that they're failing to report crimes that probably do occur and just not bothering to report them to the FBI. Is that, that right? Oh, absolutely. Our study that just came out showed that uh, Miami reported zero in 2017 and zero 2018 year to date. If I, if I may though, that being said, it's like if you have a bunch of uh, pails 
uh, in different locations and some of them are tipped over, that doesn't mean you can't get good trend analysis about what's going on. So for instance, um, when we looked at uh, some of the, the data relating to what ProPublica was the first to, to find, this big increase in the fourth quarter, which was of 2016. of 2016, which was the worst fourth quarter going back to 2008, uh, we, we looked at monthly and even daily ticks. And some of the things that we saw, for instance, was November, even with all the, the data limitations, trend analysis is pretty good because you have so much of the country that is covered. Uh, what, what we found was that November 2016 was the worst November ever and the only November that was up over October. So while there are, there are limitations, when people come out and say, well, it's completely worthless, that's not true. What it is, what it is bad at is, is getting um, a picture in, in, in various localities and then that picture with respect to different communities that uh, are very well represented, very well represented in, in those states. Uh, but the bottom line is, uh, we have massive underreporting with respect to hate crime. FBI in 2016, the last year we have available, counted 6,121 hate crimes. Bureau of Justice Statistics, which doesn't rely on police reports, somebody calls up and says, hey, something happened. Um, they found about 208,000 in residential victimization surveys. So there's a big difference. So we they, they're surveying people, they're calling them up and saying, hey, what, what happened to you? And they're getting all kinds of reports, whereas the FBI is not getting these reports. They're actually visiting houses. Oh, they're visiting? Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, if, if you go to our, uh, our, our website, you can find an interview with the person who does those every year. Um, and, and there's also gaps, for instance, that report, the victimization surveys, it's two ways that we collect data on crimes. One is what's reported to the police, the other uh, done by, by surveys. Uh, one of the biggest gaps that we've seen is with regard to crimes against the disabled. Much more represented in the victimization surveys, uh, minimally, uh, for instance, in the, um, in the reported crimes. So we know that we're leaving out communities, undocumented people, transgendered people, where we've had a, a terrible a series of, of over two dozen last year uh, murders of transgendered people, but we don't know what the motives were because a lot of times the, the folks aren't, the, the uh, offenders aren't caught. So, so as I understand it, there's three key, key issues here with the data collection. And one is that the federal law doesn't require state, local, uh, county police departments to actually submit the data on hate crimes to the FBI. Voluntary, completely voluntary. The second part is that even the ones that do submit it sometimes just aren't very diligent in investigating, aren't very diligent in collecting information, and aren't very diligent in submitting accurate data to the FBI. Is that right? Yeah, about 88% of the jurisdictions of the United States uh, just said zero or didn't participate at all. Is there any movement in Congress to say, I, you know, the FBI has come out and said, yeah, we don't have good statistics, that our data is not great, we can do a better job at this, the fact that when we survey people, they tell us about awful crimes, but it's not showing up in the FBI data. Is there any movement in Congress to do something about this? No. But let me just say, there's nothing going on with Congress with respect to, to not, it's, it's retrograde. To just give you one example. But this is emblematic. The Civil Rights Act of 64, passed after the death of JFK, created something called the Community Relations Service, a wonderful entity that goes into communities where there's racial and other kind of strife and, and works on mitigating and bringing communities together. They've been defunded under the, under the current administration. Wow, wow. You told me, uh, an interesting theory that you had. And I, I wanted to know if you could maybe share it. You said, hey, we're seeing a rise in hate crimes against whites. And you said, I have a theory about why that's happening. You want to go into that? Sure. A um, couple things. Uh, 20, one quick thing. With regard to looking at hate crime data, you all, your best place to look is the local community because the demographics, the tensions are... are are somewhat nuanced and different. Uh, but last year, 2016, with the FBI data, we saw double-digit increases against the following. 
anti-Latino, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim, anti-transgender, and anti-white. Uh, and and anti-white is one of the most common, uh, but proportionally less than what their representation of the population is. And, and I think we're living in an era of reciprocal violence, uh, un unfortunately. You were saying that you thought that this rise in organized white nationalist hate groups, white supremacist groups, that that was sort of leading to more conflict. Is that the concept? Yes. Uh, in California, for instance, we saw more violent public demonstrations, like in 2017, uh, than we did like the previous year, like almost double. Um, and I think part of that relates to the fact that white nationalism, um, and this is, this is interesting because this is not, doesn't come up in the data, but then we have other data points. Let me give you an example. White nationalism is an accepted mainstream socio-political coalesced force in the United States. It is not a fringe. So when we have 9% of Americans saying that Nazi views are acceptable, and so that's a data point. And we have, in the last two years, more mega rallies by white nationalists. When I say mega rallies, I mean rallies of 100 or more. When, when I traditionally went to these rallies you know, since the 90s, you'd get six, 15, right. 20. You know, Charlottesville was like over 500, and people came from about 35, 36 states. And we had like a bunch of these rallies. We had more of these in the last two years than the previous 10 to 20. That being said, post Charlottesville, the alt-right has imploded. Uh, they're, they're not as coalesced as they but, were. But you think that those rallies, that, that that activity is part of what you're seeing with this possible, with this rise in, in hate crimes against whites, that that's part of this sort of fraying of the social fabric. Absolutely, and, and it's, the, it, it's this, uh, I think sometimes when we look at hate crimes, you know, uh, um, one of the things that we have to be careful is say that this is just one part of a constellation of data. And what we're seeing every day are these examples, these public manifestations of, uh, of incivility against people who are perceived to be non-white. And I think that this combination is building a, a, a bit of a backlash. So for instance, in California, the worst uh, incident that we had uh, in, in the previous year was in Fresno, which is a triple murder by a, a, an African American nationalist. Let me let me just say though, I, I don't want to put, I don't want to make these things uh, equating, equivalent. but equivalent as far as the, the 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 entrenchment or the numbers. But the, but there is something going on. One last thing I wanted to ask you about is, you know, there's been this boom in anti-Semitic activity, and I honestly didn't expect to see it. What I figured that we would see is there's a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment in the political sphere right now, there's a lot of anti-Muslim sentiment, um, but you're not hearing about anti-Jewish messages so much uh, in the political sphere. Why do you think that there has been this sort of resurgence in this anti-Jewish activity? Well, we're actually now hearing it in the political sphere. It's, uh, we have someone who's running for statewide office who's like, get the Jews out of government. Oh, yeah, yeah, I met that guy. <laughs> uh, no comment. We are nonpartisan. We don't make endorsements. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but in any event, what's so interesting with regard to anti-Semitism uh, is for a while, um, 2014, we hit a, a, a low for a long time. Uh, our most recent data shows that if you look at uh, the large cities that break these things down, there's some combination in the top two, anti-black, anti-Jewish, anti-gay. Um, and New York alone had more anti-Semitic hate crimes in 2017 than the totals of all but four cities in the United States. Um, in LA, I think we had uh, 37 uh, anti-Semitic crimes, it was unchanged from the previous year. Los Angeles, 2017, big upsurge in anti-gay, a uh, slight increase in anti-black, big increase in anti-transgender. And what I think often happens is, you know, one year, like for instance, the previous year, anti-black crimes were up. Interestingly, I think a lot of this is also going into public spaces. So for instance, the internet, 
uh, you know, the ADL came up with something said there were like 4.2 million anti-Semitic Twitter uh, uh, messages. Uh, but Jews are very highly accepted in, in American society. They're about 11% of all, of all hate crimes. But when you look at the major cities, they're doubly represented in the population, and I think that also goes into their representation um, uh, as among the tops in, in, in major cities. Uh, so, which leads me to believe, based on some of the data involving the internet and some of the things that we're seeing, is that a relatively small cadre of people uh, feel emboldened. In other words, it's not like anti-Muslim sentiment, which is, uh, which is really We're ubiquitous, diffused. yeah. Um, but people now feel that it's okay. And, and, uh, and, and also there are different subtleties. Uh, one last thing, uh, with regard to anti-Semitic incidents, uh, if there was one silver lining, it was uh, we didn't see significant increases in anti-Semitic assaults until the last ADL report when we saw a doubling. Oh. On that unhappy note, I gotta <laughs> wrap it up here. Brian, thank you so much. That was Brian Levin, director of the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at Cal State San Bernardino. Thank you so much, and, and, it, and our latest data says 19% increase in California cities versus 12% for our national average. So, and fourth, I think it's, uh, we're, we're gonna have an, another consecutive year, third consecutive year of increases in California, but still half of, uh, of what we were in 2001. Thanks. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Edward Dunbar, who's an expert on the psychology of hate crime perpetrators. He's a clinical professor at UCLA. Why don't you join us, Edward? Thank you. So your latest book is all about how the Trump campaign and presidency are fueling hate-based aggression. The title of the book is Hate Unleashed, America's Cataclysmic Change. That's so I right. think that bears repeating. Hate Unleashed, America's cataclysmic change. That's a very good indicator of what people are going to read. Yes. yes. So, so, so tell me, Edward, um, what is it about what Trump says and does that sends a message to certain people and causes them to act? You know, I think, Adolfo, one of the things that struck me was it was about three weeks after the election was over, and my publisher had contacted me and said, okay, so we've you know, had you do things on hate crimes. Do you want to write a book on hate crimes in the election? And I said, I got to do something about this. So this was my chance to do it. I really looked at what had happened in the election, and I really only tried to look at things that led right up until the time of the inauguration in February. And you know, I was as much as I think anybody thinking, well, maybe this is all rhetoric. Maybe this is all just a good sales pitch, the art of the deal. Uh, you know, I used to work in a state senate office, not in California, someplace else. And you know, we would all the time want to get in the media and get our person, you know, front page and all that sort of thing. I didn't really know what was going to happen. You know, I saw the indicators and I saw the indicators of what it was sort of predicated upon. And um, the publisher said the part about hate unleashed, and I said, well, it's cataclysmic. And they said, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, well. It's cataclysmic because we're now starting to use hate speech as part of our political rhetoric, not on the fringes, but as a mainstream way of talking about political differences. And I thought, you know, one, we're seeing this now becoming something just a normative part of their discussion. And number two, I thought we were seeing the whole old idea of the culture wars, which really has been around for the last 20, 30 years, being seriously kind of discussed as something that we were now going to vote on a winner-loser kind of a culture. And I said, I think that's the other thing we're now looking at. We're saying those that lose don't just have to work with, but have to be denigrated or marginalized, or as now we're finding out, deported or worse, incarcerated. And I said, I think that that's what you know, really makes the Trump presidency going forward really challenging. It definitely made what we saw with the whole election process very challenging. And a little bit what I also looked at, you know, was very simply, 
not only the psychology of bias and the idea of everyday biases that we all hold prejudices, we all hold assumptions. And when you looked at how voter behavior was being measured, some of the neuroscience said, well, you know what? People may say they're not sure two weeks before the election, but if you really watch what they're doing, they've already decided, and they were going to this very strong bias-based belief system. So, so explain how, as a psychologist, you looked at the utterances of Donald Trump and what happened when certain people heard those utterances yeah. and carried out certain actions. Well, I mean, as, as you were already talking about earlier, you know, this is all about history just continuing. I mean, we're, you know, we're not learning from history. So indeed, we're seeing some of the classic kind of ideas of xenophobia, ultranationalism, the, I would call it sort of a, the nostalgia for another age, the making America, you know, great again, as if this is something we're, you know, going to make this country something that should be better. You know, and, you know, Brian and I have been doing this kind of work for quite a while, and if we were all here 20 years ago. Hold the mic closer to your mouth. Sure. Yeah. If we were here 20 years ago, we would have been talking about hate crime laws as a form of supporting a civil society, raising us to a higher standard. Here we are 20 years later, and I think what we're looking at instead is, is this leading us into seeing hate as a form of political, not only expression, but political violence? You know, when you say political violence, I think of Argentina during the Dirty War, I think of Guatemala, I think of Central America in the 1980s. Why are you calling um, the actions by people who hear Donald Trump political violence? Well, for exactly what you just talked about is that we are seeing the same sorts of phenomena in our country now that you could see in Argentina you know, with the Proceso, that you could see in the Czech Republic over the last half century, in the Soviet Union, in all of those countries of totalitarianism and authoritarianism. I think we all collectively don't know where this is all gonna go to. And I've seen the rhetoric as maybe getting a person elected. The challenge now is, I think also, how it's emboldening people to unleash this bias in themselves in a way that now we're making more acceptable. And I think that's one of the really dangerous things we're all now looking at is bias and prejudice not being something that we look down upon, but we sort of normalized it, including in our stakeholders, our ICE agents, our immigration agents, our law enforcement, and the like. Edward, in this day and age when facts and peer-reviewed research is uh, kind of thrown out the window by many people, I feel I have to make a pause and you know underline the facts that and the yeah. research that yeah. went into your book. So just yeah. briefly tell me what research went into this book about uh, Hate Unleashed. Sure. Well, sure, thank you. Um, you know, part of it was just to look at the, the body count after the election of the number of people that were saying, I have been a target of a hate incident or a hate crime, and the number of them that identified this as having to do with the use of political speech and rhetoric as, you know, tying it into the election. But in addition to that, I also looked at things such as indicators of state behavior having to do with economic changes, having to look at the percentage of the population that was identified as non-Hispanic white. And I tried to say, how did this predict? And you know, we found that you know, states with a declining average family income you know, went for Trump. We found states that were becoming less white went for Trump. And Barbara Fields, who's a Columbia University historian at the end of Ken Burns, the Civil War, you know, looks at the camera and says, you know, the Civil War is not over. We're not sure who's won. And I kind of think of what we're seeing now as sort of really breaking into this red state, blue state phenomena. I mean, if you look at just what states went for Trump, all of the Confederacy but Virginia supported candidate Trump. And the part that's embedded in that that concerns me and that um, Brian and I have talked about as well is if you look at the idea of underreportage of hate crimes, if you look at it in the long view, very few things are good predictors of why do some states not report them. The strongest thing I've been able to find to the science of it all is the tradition of black lynchings at a state level both reporting underreportage of hate crimes since the laws were passed in the early 90s, but also supporting Canada Trump. You, you've also uh, done research on how not all hate crimes are created equal, how some 
hate crimes, those uh, targeting um, people who are gay, lesbian, transgender, and African American are oftentimes more virulent, much more violent right. than hate crimes targeting um, Jews or Mexican Americans. What, what, what's going on? Why is that? Well, I mean, indeed, one of the things about the difference of the violence is, you know, you start to think of some of these as really being symbolic acts. And again, because it's denigrating maybe a person's group or it's property crime, doesn't make it without an impact upon the entire group. But when we start to see violent crimes that indeed do target gays and lesbians, sexual minorities, and African Americans, I think we're looking at also a normative idea that there are certain populations that we as a culture allow that violence will be perpetrated against. And that, you know, we're setting a tone not just for our general attitudes, but also for people that are more likely to be violent and aggressive in general. And they gravitate to those targets. I mean, I've said this many times to people all over the planet. I say, you know, in Los Angeles, if you're gonna gay bash a person and you live out in the high desert, you're driving for 75, 90 minutes. And, you know, people will laugh and I say, but that's 75 or 90 minutes to think, maybe you just wanna go grab a beer and watch a sports game, or go home, or do something, play pool. It's an effort to go find folks that we see, and there's this idea that that's something people really gravitate towards in our community. So, so that's interesting. So uh, somebody who goes after Adolfo Guzman Lopez for pronouncing his name mm. as Adolfo Guzman Lopez mm. is going after him more than just the individual, he's going uh, Absolutely. After a group Absolutely. of people that say Absolutely. those words in a particular way. You know, I spent about five years inside the LAPD criminal conspiracy unit and about four or five years before that with the LA Human Relations Commission taking apart each case by case and looking at this. You know, and surprise, surprise, almost always there's no relationship of the victim to their offender. In many cases, as people are more biased, as we show the indicators of having more of an ideology, you travel farther from your home and you're more violent when you get there. What, what is it about your research that you think the general public should take away, almost like a, you know, kind of a, from a, a consumer's point of view, uh, right? What, yeah. what, what can we take away from what you've, you've researched to help us deal with these things day in, day out? Well, I mean, there's, there's some things which are not necessarily so um, reassuring. One is that the idea that hate is a natural human phenomena. I mean, it hasn't been evolutionarily selected out in the millennia. So hate and violence is just part of the human experience. What I think we need to look at is where do we set the bar? Do we set the bar to say that we value the idea of public safety? Because to me also, hate crimes and hatred is a public health issue. And what I mean by that is, people who are the targets of hate may not go to hospitals after they've been the crime victim. They may not go to law enforcement because they may think that this is something they're not gonna get support from stakeholders. People suffer, and often they suffer in silence. Immigrant populations, where they come from communities of political violence in their home countries, people that have been marginalized, or indeed people who, in psychology we talk about the idea of like prolonged duress. It's just another day in the life. So a, a very good colleague of mine, a black psychiatrist, said after 9-11, he goes, welcome to the world. He goes, this is what a lot of people of color deal with every single day. This is just to remind the rest of you what we've always been dealing with. You talk about a dynamic uh, also in which the perpetrator targets certain uh, people or groups because uh, he or she feels that those victims will not speak out, will not go out and Absolutely. report uh, the, uh, the the crime, right. and you in turn say that some of those uh, victims don't. Well, it's not only that the victims may not report, and indeed in, in some of the work I've done here in Los Angeles, people that are the targets of more violent hate crimes are less likely to go to the police than if it's a graffiti crime or hate speech. You see that, but you also, when you really look at this on an individual level, and I mean, as a clinical psychologist, I've treated hate crime victims, I've treated hate crime offenders. I've even evaluated people before they became hate crime offenders. I've had students who've been gay bashed. So I've seen this at a very immediate level. I've seen people who have advanced university degrees who have 20, 30 hate offenses. This is not just people that are marginalized. 
these are complex issues, and if we allow this to just kind of digress into a place where we're going to see more and more of this gratuitous violence, um, we're changing our social norms in a very fundamental way. So, so Edward, uh, living in a representative democracy, mm. uh, we have we uh, elected officials who carry out uh, the wishes of uh, hopefully not just the electorate, those people who elected them, but uh, the public good. So right mm -hmm. now we're in a very critical time in Los Angeles right. because the way in the city of Los Angeles, the way things work is that uh, the police chief is uh, selected through a somewhat um, uh, open process of a commission and then the mayor uh, picks the police chief. Let's, uh, what grade would you give outgoing LAPD chief uh, Charlie Beck regarding the enforcement of hate crime statutes and, and really going after these crimes? Uh, tell us briefly. In, in UCLA, we'll give people incompletes and say, come back and keep working on it, you know? <laughs> Um, Boy, she, okay. I, that, that's sort of to, to buy a little time to say it this way. I wouldn't comment as much there. I could say people such as Chief Parks was a strong advocate for the work of improving training of the responding officers, of making this a serious priority with the police commission. I can say I've seen some of the people that followed him that really, frankly, didn't care about hate crimes. And you know, we would have to work in spite of not having the support from the leadership. I think it's a time in a place like Los Angeles to say that should be a real gold standard of anybody who's going to be leading law enforcement, a multicultural community, an international community. We need to see this as a very high priority, not as just sort of an add-on issue that we talk about once or twice a year. And this is what makes it harder for people who uh, participate is that You've got the sheriff's department, you know, overseeing law enforcement in unincorporated areas in many cities that can't that don't run their police departments. You've got large police departments in Long Beach. So it's not just um, you know about pushing Los Angeles. It's about pushing you know elected officials in many other absolutely offices. absolutely. And when we live in this community, we have to be sensitive to the political leadership at all levels. Uh, you know, Edward, to wrap up this conversation, one of the things about you that caught my attention with is that you're a, a, a practitioner of kundalini yoga is that correct y y yes <laughs> so um, i wasn't expecting that it, but yes it, well it, <laughs> it, it, in this we'll all breathe in a minute okay. in, in, in this era yeah. where so many things are happening that cause us to turn to ourselves and engage in self-care and in um, you know really taking care of ourselves so that we can continue to engage is that something that has allowed you to separate the doom and gloom of what you're researching and give you more uh, energy? You know, I used to teach uh, meditation in Rikers Island in New York City in a prison, and the beauty was everybody always showed up because they had no choice, you know? <laughs> it's a wonderful way to do things. Um, somebody years ago wrote a very short little article saying racism makes you crazy, meaning that if you deal with this all the time, yeah, you get kind of crazy. And I would say probably many of the people in the audience here, you know, we're here for a purpose. And there are good people that came before us. There are going to be good people that come after us. We definitely need to find a way to kind of get through these very trying times and kind of stay the course. And it's easy to give up. And it's easy to get very cynical. And I have felt people that work in the human rights and human relations commissions, you know, th there's a real burnout issue. And there's a challenge. And, you know, I mean, I, I get Christmas cards from stalkers. I remember right after 9-11, I got emails saying that I was a race traitor. Um, a friend of mine who uh, I went to high school with out in the San Fernando Valley, when he's off his meds, he sends me those kinds of emails too. And I say, Michael, get back on your medita medication. He does better. Yeah, these are very, very challenging issues, and both for the victims, the first responders, but also for us, the advocates. Edward Dunbar, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. I must confess, I have become the thing I hate the most, a hater. As a hip hop head, there is nothing more despicable than a hater. 
There are hundreds of songs defaming them, and I pride myself on not being one, but alas, my facade is cracking. It's all a lie. I hate. It's complicated, like the relationship I have with myself is complicated. I often say, my self-loathing knows no bounds, and it's true. I've heard I can come off as arrogant or narcissistic sometimes, mostly by people I've loved. I hate that it might be true, but if that's your experience of me, who am I to say you're wrong? There's plenty to hate about me. I'm late, I procrastinate, I take on more than I can handle, react poorly when I feel wrong. I've done wrong too. For instance, one time in high school, a kid asked me for a ride home and I agreed until he tried to sell us, his new friends, CDs. But I sold CDs, so you gotta walk, bruh. I didn't care how many hoods he had to walk through and how scared he felt every day walking home, nor how happy he was to not have to take that walk and maybe find new friends and clientele. I hate myself for that. It's a regret that haunts me. I hope he made it home. Speaking of home, I hate that when I was a child, perhaps a teen, but definitely a child, a loved one, someone I love, put a 357 Magnum to my head because he thought another loved one, someone I loved, belonged to a different gang. Not even a fact, just suspected. He hated so much that he put a gun to my young skull and when I looked into his eyes, I knew his hate came from pain. I mean, it all comes from somewhere. And knowing that, I try to see the whole picture, but I hate that I have to be so understanding and accepting of the fault in myself and others. I mean, why do I need to hear you? Why do I have to consider the other side? Why empathy? Why can't I just be mean and punch people if I feel insulted or disagree? I mean, it works for white nationalists, so why not me? Why do I have to turn the other cheek? Our freedom, air quotes for the radio, don't look the same. And unfortunately, that makes me hate you. And I don't even know you. The lines on my forehead come from the angry black man scowl, apparently still present when I smile, that I've been trying to hold down so you don't feel threatened when I glance at you from across the room. Is it considered a hate crime when you call police on black people for no reason? It should be. So now I hate you, me, we, us, but why? Is it in my DNA? Is it from trauma baked into my body from years of growing up in a neighborhood known better for drugs, gangs, and rides than it is for the towers, the arts, and the families that make Watts beautiful? Is it because of broken promises? Is it from the centuries of trauma heaped upon my ancestors, stolen from their homeland, slaves in bondage, Jim Crow, and every horror glossed over in our history books, and the continued persecution where human beings become hashtags that you either forget, never forget, or fail to keep track of because the body count is staggering? I was watching the news with my loved ones the other day, and in four minutes, they talked about school shootings, a local stabbing, children being tortured by their parents, arson, and maybe three more topics I blocked out for my personal self-care. So while I continue to wrestle with the sources of my own hate, I look to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who said, I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. He also said, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. I hate that I had to bring up so many horrible things in my few minutes. So, love. Please love. So that was Bruce A. Lemon Jr. with his piece, Four Minutes. Wow, powerful. 
amazing stuff. Everybody tonight has had an amazing voice, something amazing to say, or scary, or sad, or grim. And I think the next phase here, we've looked at the past, we've looked at the present, and we're going to look at the future now. And I think there's a, a piece of hope here, because I go to these rallies against the white supremacists, I go to these rallies against hate crimes, and what I'm seeing is people building coalitions, I see people reaching out to other people in their communities. I see people uh, reaching out to members of other faiths and actually uh, communicating and realizing that they have a common foe in, in hatred. And so we want to bring in activists, community leaders, and get them to share with us where they think this is all going. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Melissa R. Clinton. She's a senior vice president and general counsel at the Aerospace Corporation. She's also an advisory board member for Not In Our Town. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Tracy Katokiriyama. She's an artist with the Pull Project Ensemble. And she's an organizer with Vigilant Love Coalition. She's a director co-founder of the Tuesday Night Project. Next we have Ahmed. Amjad Mahmoud Khan. He's a partner at Brown, Neri, Smith & Khan, an adjunct professor at UCLA Law School, National Director of Public Affairs for Ahmadiyya Muslim Community USA. And uh, please welcome Irene Monica Sanchez, PhD. She's a poet, she's a writer, and she also teaches ethnic studies in the Azusa Unified School District and at Bard College in Los Angeles. Welcome. So I wanted to, to talk to you um, as somebody who's been active on these issues and also experienced serious trauma in your own life. When you hear these stories, when you look at the headlines, uh, do you feel fearful or do you feel like something positive can be coming out of all this? Probably a mixture of both. You know, I, I don't believe we will ever eradicate hate. In fact, I know we won't. Um, I think it's something that my grandparents battled in their time. Um, I am battling now, and I have three beautiful chocolate children, and they will battle it too. Um, but what I love about what you're doing is the way you battle it is by having a conversation, by coalescing, by discussing what ails us. So. Something as idiotic, for example, as um, Roseanne Barr and what she did is actually terrific because it shines a spotlight. Like we all recoil from it. But in fact, I think what we need to do is embrace it because it sparks a dialogue. What, what happened at Starbucks while appalling um, sparks a dialogue. So I don't think it'll ever go away. I just think those of us who stand for the good you know, for um, expelling ignorance, um, need to rally like you're doing now, and we need to keep having conversations, and we need to not be silenced um, out of fear. Thank you. Yeah. So, so, so this, uh, this idea of, of coalition building, of connecting with people outside your group was, was very interesting to me. A and Tracy, I wanted to ask you about a little bit about how you're doing that uh, in some of the work that you're doing. You were telling me about how you're deeply rooted in the multi-generational Japanese-American experience in Los Angeles. And uh, for anybody who spends, you know, uh, time in Los Angeles, you know that there's just, that can, there's such richness to the Japanese-American experience going back more than 100 years here. And so, what, how is it that you talk to your Japanese American aunts and uncles or community, and which is a very tight knit community, and talk to them about relating to other groups? Yeah, um, I think it. You know, I, I I think as with probably any community, we have a wide spectrum of um, folks who I think come from all kinds of different ideas politically. And um, I, I know that I sometimes get 
extremely frustrated with my own community, the parts of it that um, don't show up for other folks today, you know, especially because we have aunties, uncles, grandparents, parents who were put away in mass during World War II. So my, my mom's side of the family, my dad's side of the family, they were all you know, in West LA in Torrance and they were rooted up and put away into Manzanar. And, um, and, and so the, the community went through a lot of struggle, a lot of silence for 40 years and finally broke their silence collectively on the road to redress and then gained redress. And in that movement, we would not have won redress without the help of many, many, many other communities. And so it is a little frustrating to me sometimes when, so for instance, after San Bernardino in 2015, we were organizing a vigil in Little Tokyo, um, and uh, one of my elders spoke to one of her elders who had been put away in camp during the war, and, and she was saying, you know, you know, we're gonna have this vigil, you know, we really want to make sure that we stand strong for the Muslim community. And um, he said, you know, if I were white back then, you know, because she said, it, I, I relate this to what happened to, you know, all of us way, way back then. And he said, if I were white back then, I would have put us away too. And he walked away. Wow. And so that kind of thing, I'm just like, wow, what has gone on for him in his life that he comes around to that point, you know what I mean? And at the same time, I have to say, I, I acknowledge also the community that did raise me, um, a community that is very fierce about standing up for justice and like standing alongside folks. So like Taz, and, uh, Taz who uh, was the first poet, we belong to a group called Vigilant Love, and we work together uh, in community uh, with a lot of really solid organizers around issues of Islamophobia and, um, yeah, so it's, it, it's a tough balance, though, sometimes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Todd, could you tell us about the work you're doing? Uh, I keep hearing from these KPC pe people, they're like, he's amazing, he's doing this incredible work. So tell us about it. Well, um, I think that's overly generous, but um, I, I feel that um, being born and raised in Southern California, as an American Muslim, it's a very intriguing time to be um, active. And I guess my experience really is born out of the fact that when 9-11 happened, it was my first week of law school. I remember that very well because um, the flight that was hijacked, the United flight, um, it was the same flight that my parents and I took a week prior to 9-11. Um, wow. I remember being dropped off by my parents and it was a surreal moment, you know, and, and I remember that first week of law school, actually Elena Kagan, a Supreme Court Justice Kagan was my professor and the class was interrupted and it was that moment. And I, I remember every minute of that moment actually. And it was that sort of defining moment for me where I realized that nothing heretofore would be the same. And it's that arc now, I guess, of, of 16 or 17 years as a lawyer, as a litigator, as someone who teaches, um, and as an American Muslim activist that drives a lot of the work. And what I feel is that being a part of the largest mosque in San Bernardino County and after those attacks, that that attack on December 2nd, 2015 hit, it was a real opportunity because it was one of those moments where you can either cower and stay you know, within your home or you can actually do something dramatic. And I remember uh, my wife who wears the headscarf, uh, w looks exactly the same age, similar make to the person who committed the atrocity. And we were walking in the supermarket. And I remember the feeling of, of getting those additional looks and what we would do. And there was some thought that perhaps we should be careful. But instead what we did, we did this large vigil uh, type event at our mosque. And we had 450 people hours after that attack. And our mosque, which was a beacon of peace for 30 years there, was opened up to the entire community and the first responders. And so to kind of put it succinctly, I feel like I view 
in today's climate, I view my work as in, in a first response mentality. You know, the first responders are, are the heroes and the policemen and firemen who, who protect us, but the interfaith community is, we're also part of the first response team. And I think that's why I, I do believe I am an optimist in this uh, very difficult climate. And I think that work really has a lot of value. And um, I really actually, as you mentioned, Melissa, um, there's a lot of teachable moments. And I'm, I'm actually proud to be a part of that. So, so in, in, in order to gauge what awaits us in the future re re regarding hate and hate crimes, um, all we have to do is look at the, the teens. We have to look at young people, right, to see what they're, what they're telling us. And I think over the last uh, several months, we've heard a lot from teens as to what they feel about certain political issues. Now, Irene, I, everybody uh, here on the stage does some kind of educational work, but you do it Monday through Friday. You go in to the classrooms, and correct me if I'm describing it, not describing it correctly, but you're an itinerant teacher. You go and teach uh, Latino studies in the classrooms in mostly working class, predominantly Latino, Mexican-American neighborhoods in Azusa. So um, what is it that you have learned about hate from listening, listening, but there's a, because they're, they're, you teach them quite a bit, but from listening to these young people? What have you learned about hate from listening to the teens? Unfortunately, uh, what I've learned about it is that it's still happening. Uh, the same rhetoric, obviously, you turn on the TV and you still see the same thing that I'm teaching them about history. AC, you mentioned you talked to Gustavo and about o Orange County and the racism and the hate that happened, um, You know, the lynchings that happened you mentioned, I was listening. And those are all things that are in their textbook. It's in Occupied America, and that's what they're reading. That is a college-level text that you know they use in universities when I used to teach in universities. And what you find is that you know the lynchings happen because of trespassing, all these things. So the students are telling me how they get criminalized for these things about um, you know property crimes or being accused of certain things, certain types of brutality or being accused of things. But what they're also saying is that some of these things still happen in our schools where. Um, you know, we could be watching the movie Walkout that was about the 1968 walkouts, and I'm like, how many of you have experienced, you know, a teacher saying something derogatory? And there are, I was, I was shocked, to be honest, that... What did they tell you? What, what are teachers telling, saying um, to the students? There were students reporting to me that teachers called them retards and morons and just using the most derogatory terms to describe them, and that reminded me of, you know, when I look back in history, 1920s, you're looking at a period where you know, the, the IQ test is used to justify having Mexicans in Mexican schools, that they are inferior, and then you go to a step further, and it's like, no, 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 we didn't segregate them because they're Mexican, we segregated them, you know, and that they're, you know, we're not saying they're inferior, we're saying they speak Spanish, right? And so I feel like Spanish has become this code word, you know, for, for justifying hate uh, against immigrants and and um, just people of color and, and Latinos in general. And so now, you know, it's hard to ignore when you turn on the TV and there was that man in New York, you know, telling, um, you know, over there at, the, at a restaurant or, or what have you, right? And he was telling these women that were talking to a worker that you have to speak English, right? These English only policies are very um, hateful. They're very hateful still to this day. And I was just shocked that students still reported that those kinds of attitudes still exist. Another student had mentioned that um, last year at some point a teacher asked them basically, how many of you have parents that speak Spanish at home? And you know, maybe half the class they said their hands went up. And the teacher told the students basically that um, you go home and tell your parents that they need to speak English, they're in America. And that, I think, is still the general attitude to this day. You have, even last year, over in uh, Rubido, right? Rubido High School. Um, that's, that's in a, Riverside. That's in Riverside. That's a high school I went to myself. There was an incident that made national news of um, teachers that Day Without Immigrants that happened in February 2017. Uh, the Day Without Immigrants, the next, basically that night, teachers went online saying, you know, these are the students that are lazy, they probably went to get drunk. You know, this is all rhetoric from, from times past, right? And 
you know, students walked out after that, and I went to join them because I had a day off of work, so I took my family. And um, basically, those kinds of things are still happening, and, and you know, they're still waiting for those people to get disciplined. And so, you know, in some ways, I was shocked that my own students were telling this, me this, but in other ways, I wasn't because I had seen what happened at Rubido last year. And I think teaching them, you know, has has um, value, right? Teaching Latino studies, ethnic studies, um, because it empowers them to know the truth about the history of this taking place. Well, and the research shows that teaching everybody Latino studies makes them more tolerant and is 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 good yeah, across ethnic groups. Hey, see, did you did you have a question? I, Irene, when you were speaking, I was wondering uh, about the the converse. Like, what is it about your students that you see and you that is making you hopeful that, you know, what are they saying to you when you listen to them, you say, hey, these are smart kids, they're figuring this stuff out, maybe they're ahead of where we were, anything like that? I feel like they do understand what's going on. I think we underestimate the youth um, at all points in time. I've worked with a lot of young people over the years, even when I was teaching uh, at the college level, finishing my grad school, and I think they're underestimated. We, we, we don't give them credit for what they see going on, and it's a challenging time to live in right now. It's very challenging, the things that are going on. Um, you know, these aren't just like privileged kids and you know, that sort of thing, and so I see so much in them that, you know, I, I, t I reassure them though, because I feel like their whole schooling lives, for many kids of color, are told that you are inferior, you're made to feel a certain way, and so for someone to come in who, kind of identifies, they can identify with, I think has been helpful because now they see like, well, I can do this, you know, and I'm telling them you can't go to college. In the beginning of the year, you ask them, how many of you want to go to college? And I didn't have that many students raising their hands. And now if you ask them, they believe that they can go and that they're capable of doing things, right? And I think it just takes, um, you know, that history is empowering, right? That there's a reason why things the way are the way they are, and I think we need to help, I guess, facilitate that understanding, because like you're saying, it's not just me teaching, it's also me listening and learning from them. I, I really do believe that. And so I think we need more of that, and I think the work of everyone here is, is facilitating that process, whether it's in a classroom, and you gotta think beyond the four walls of any institution, right? It's, it's out here, um, it's, it's with the people, and that's, I think, how we can make this better. Can I just add to what Irene said? So, you know, unfortunately, I'm on this panel because someone set my home on fire in 2015 in Manhattan Beach. And um, with 0.8% representation of African Americans, we pretty much knew why they'd done it, although we weren't new to the neighborhood, right? We'd lived there a decade. So I'm having a conversation with my three kids, most notably my son, who was a sophomore in high school. And I like what you said, because what do you tell a young man who's going to be graduating soon and has had his first life-altering, life-threatening encounter with his race that has nothing to do with who he is on the inside? And what you end up saying is, this is your opportunity to change the narrative, right? And I think that, so some idiot just wrote your college essay to any college in the United States. <laughs> Right? That's, right? that's what some idiot just did. So you have an opportunity to recoil or to be empowered by your experience. And I think anyone who's targeted for idiocy, which is what hate is, has an opportunity to change the narrative. And that is how we empower ourselves. And Melissa, I, just, I wanted to add, that's such a powerful point. I, I remember the day after the San Bernardino attack, um, I, a mosque that was in Hawthorne that I, my, my kids grew up in and spent a lot of time in the South Bay, not too far from Manhattan Beach, actually. Um, 24 hours after, there was a ton of graffiti all over that mosque, this beautiful structure that we uh, loved and cherished. And um, the word Jesus was, was put across um, the crescent and then the mosque. And it was a really terrible incident. And I just remember thinking about that and how we all felt because we were all really were scared and frightened and worried and our kids were worried. But I thought to myself that it's, it's, it's an amazing irony actually because the idea that the notion, the person who committed that act thought that perhaps the congregants, the Muslims in there 
may not revere Jesus or believe in Jesus. And I was thinking to myself, because I attended that mosque every Friday for prayers and Sunday for school and so forth, how many times the name of Jesus was mentioned in the four corridors of that mosque in a, in a beautiful, positive light, how an entire chapter in the Quran is devoted to the Mother Mary, how there's such a reverence in Islam for this beautiful, wonderful human being. And yet the person who committed the act doesn't know what the conversations, the content of what is happening inside. So there, thereafter, it became a teachable moment that it's really the teachings of Jesus that I want my kids to know, that Jesus would never have allowed that act. And as an American Muslim, it's very important to have that conversation. So I do believe that these, these incidences really give an opportunity to kind of frame the narrative in a different way. And, and the irony of that is you can just Google that, right? You can Google, you know, Jesus and the Quran, Jesus and services. So, which, which makes me think of how this tension between having so much information in the palm of your hand, yet this kind of, uh, this kind of work to, um, m you know, make bridges is one that's, that, that involves being face to face that involves being in front of somebody. Did, w w w would you care to, to talk about that? Yeah, I, I, I think what I love that we're all talking about here is really like relationship building, right, and communication, and connecting past uh, struggle, even if it's super recent, with what we're gonna do next and how we're gonna treat each other. And, um, you know, I, I, I've been able to watch uh, this program in the community called Bridging Communities that brings together uh, Muslim high school and college students with Japanese American high school and college students. And they go through a process over several months of visiting detention centers and mosques and um, spiritual places and going through just a process of getting to know each other. And, um, and it culminates with them going on a bus together in April to the annual pilgrimage to Manzanar. And going on that bus with them and stopping off at the McDonald's on the way home, you know, and just sort of like having them speak about everything that they're absorbing, right? Like we go to the desert and it's, it's basically a set of mirrors, right? We see ourselves there, even if we ourselves were not put there, right? And so, um, I think it takes time. I think that this work is all about the long haul, right? It's not one class, it's a whole course and a series of courses and other ethnic studies courses, right? It's time. I think we need to always take time to build these relationships. Thank you. This is such an inspiring panel. And I mean, for talking about a lot of really grim things, like I think this is a good direction for us to go and you're all really inspiring people. So thank you so much, Melissa Clinton, Tracy Kato Kiriyama, Amjad Mahmoud Khan, and Irene Monica Sanchez, PhD. Thank you. So in late March, KPCC met with a number of community members for an all-day session to explore this theme of hate. We shared first-hand experiences, reactions, and thoughts of the many outcomes from the day was a forward-looking affirmation. Uh, tonight, four of the people who participated in that session join us to share with you now that affirmation. They are Dante Michel, Michel, Mitchell, Sonia Smith-Kang, Cesar Arredondo, and Cheryl Farrell. Why don't you give them a hand? Tonight, we offer this affirmation. In the anticipation of hate and oppression, I will remember. Hate speech is a plea to be seen and heard when compassion doesn't seem enough. Hate 
comes from a person who wants to share their pain. Hate is a learned response. Hate is the symptom of an illness. I will remember who I am is enough. In the face of hate and oppression, I give myself permission to take up space, prioritize my safety and well-being, resist dehumanizing narratives, acknowledge the wholeness of my humanity, be radically inclusive, identify and honor my limits, remain anchored in culture. Remember that hatred exploits impressionable minds. I, I will remember, remember who I am is enough. In the wake of hate and oppression, I will mourn, honor the natural pace that my anger takes, compassionately give myself to unapologetic processing, define my own limits, define my own rules to engage or disengage, I, I will heal, heal. I, I will respect. respect, I will remember who we are is enough. Thank you so much, Dante, Sonia, Cesar, Cheryl, and the rest of our guest this evening. Thanks to ProPublica and KPCC in-person teams and to the James Irvine Foundation for all of your support. And thank you, all of you, for joining us because this is uh, what you heard is the then, now, and tomorrow of hate and hate crimes. But really, it's up to you to go out in your communities, in your neighborhoods, in your workplace, and talk about these things. Uh, we hope you'll stick around for a bit in the lobby. Uh, there's going to be a reception, and we'll see you there. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>